This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, uh, thanks everyone. Um, we're at, we've reached the end of researching contemporary culture. I'm really pleased <coughs> to introduce uh, Dr. Matt Hill from the National Aboriginal School of uh, Cardiff University. Um, um, yeah, yeah, five, maybe. Yeah, just yeah. a couple of notches up. Um, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> murky half light's probably good because the way I've done slides, I've done white lecture and dark background. So that's, that's fine for people to see. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you can see some examples of Matt's works, fan cultures, and China of uh, the time and I guess, um, uh, you know, like I said, you're really your, your best known for your work on Doctor Who uh, and on. On fandom, so today you're going to talk a bit about over those. Yeah, yeah. So, you've got uh, Professor Matt as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so I, I expect you've had quite a busy day already, um, so uh, I've been asked to talk for about half an hour, so I don't get too much over that. Uh, I might go a little bit over, but hopefully, we'll get a good amount of time uh, for discussion uh, afterwards. So, what not to read uh, online spoilers and fan interpretive communities as multi dimensional kind of layerings uh, and different ways in which uh, interpretive communities can form and reform and kind of recompose uh, or shift over time or respond to specific um, fan incidents really is part of what I'm interested in. But significantly in relation to the concept of the spoiler. Uh, and as, as the kind of books there show, this kind of emerges out of ongoing work. Uh, I'm currently working on Calgrave Pivot, which is a kind of half length monograph, um, sort of 30 to 50,000 word monograph about Doctor Who's 50th anniversary. Uh, so, some of what I'm going to talk about today kind of comes out of that. It also goes back to some concepts from fan cultures, which was quite a while ago now, and also goes back a little bit to some work from Triangle Time Lord, which was from 2010. Uh, so, what I want to suggest is that in relation to contemporary media culture, uh, there is still a form of, we may have moved away from theorising the classic Henry Jenkins textual approaches on here, but there are still conflict struggles, um, particularly in relation, not only uh, in relation to interpretation and textual interpretation, but also in relation to information about texts uh, and information that might precede the existence of a text even its official release. Uh, so what I've called info war, informational war between uh, fan cultures and media producers um, can still tend to be the case, but it can work in slightly different ways to classic models of textual coaching, because there the argument was it was about how media texts were interpreted. Uh, so, in a way, I'm interested in kind of inserting those of interpretive community into a cultural space which precedes the existence and, and the official uh, release of um, commercial. Um, textual material. Uh, Amelie Hasty talks about cult TV. Um, she doesn't actually refer to Doctor Who specifically, but she's talking about things like Buffy, uh, predominantly, but also Twin Peaks, The X-Files, Star Trek, a whole graph <coughs> of uh, what would now be seen really as classic cult TV. And Hasty suggests that these are all types of cult TV that tend to be textually invested in knowledge, uh, and that therefore it's no accident that their fan cultures equally become invested in ways of knowing and amassing almost encyclopedic and highly detailed um, and structured and communally structured and interpretive community uh, forms of knowledge about these texts. Uh, so as Hassan says, with their narrative tropes and often open-ended nature, these kinds of cult TV shows invite fans to participate in a world of knowledge and therefore almost mimetically is the implication to construct further knowledge about them, uh, and the kind of useful term um, that I want to relate to debates around interpretive community is the notion of an epistemological economy. Um, so, an economy of knowledge linked to learning about um, a hyperdiegesis, an expansive, open narrative universe. Which, of course, although that can kind of form the basis for fan identities and performances of fan knowledge. As it points out, it's very much still tied to what we would think of more conventionally as an economy, i.e. a consumerist uh, economy. Um, now what I've become interested in is what I want to, in, to do this kind of information war between fans and producers, is what I term pretextual poaching. 
So this isn't conflict uh, between fans and producers uh, that is post-textual, where it's classically Star Trek fans kind of uh, focusing on certain relationships, character relationships, or creating slash fiction, um, shifting meanings in the text, is the kind of classic argument, or selectively poaching, um, as it were, and not preferred uh, meanings from the text. Instead, what tends to happen, uh, I focused on in uh, more recent work on Doctor Who, is this notion of the pretextual, uh, which becomes uh, <coughs> a kind of key threat to branding practices. That is to say, um, I would suggest that the producers of Doctor Who are concerned up to a point with meanings that audiences make, so they're concerned up to a point with the traditional notion of the interpretive community that reads in certain ways or looks for certain things and found it, you can fit fandom into that approach. Um, they're slightly, in a sense, producers are more concerned with what fans do with information they can access before the text is released, before it's broadcast effectively, TX, uh, or transmission date uh, in the TV industry. So fans, uh, using social media, using um, what are almost old school fan forums now, will try to collate um, leaks or rumours or bits of information and they'll work as a community to pull uh, those bits of knowledge and to try to find out ahead of press releases, ahead of official information, effectively what is going to happen in Doctor Who or who's been cast or who is the director or uh, what is the big kind of narrative twist of the series or what's going to happen in the finale. Um, so spoilers, which I guess is a term we're probably all familiar with now, it's a relatively unusual term sort of five, ten years ago, but it's become quite mainstream now. So the notion that you would find something out ahead of actually reading a text, viewing a text, and that supposedly that should spoil your enjoyment if you know the twist or the reveal, as it's sometimes called. You know. um, so the term is used to spoiler, although given that pretextual poachers are fans who want to find spoilers out, uh, whereas the producers want to prevent that from happening. Why? Because they're concerned it will damage the brand. Particularly, they're not so worried if spoilers circulate in fan online spaces, but if they get into the tabloid press, um, if they get into the sun or the mirror, if they get, basically get into uh, kind of mass media, uh, then the producers will be, oh, you know, they tend to be very upset about that, because the, the show that hasn't been screened uh, has been preempted and damaged um, in relation to its kind of brand value. Spoilers are kind of, um, so the term spoilers we might be familiar with, but what exactly counts as a spoiler uh, continues to be hotly debated, so we might get to have a version of this debate uh, a bit later on. Um, but what tends to be the case, and some fans will disagree vehemently with this, is that any information that is officially released, so an official trailer, um, or an official press release, um, or a clip, uh, anything that is officially released um, is generally deemed not to be a spoiler. And the expectation is, is that audiences will be aware of that. Uh, of course, given that online fandom, digital fandom is transnational, <coughs> that introduces that whole kind of nightmare scenario or problem because something could be officially released in one region or territory but hasn't been seen officially in another one and often there can be months in between those, those dates. Um, so, in a sense, the official release equals non spoiler thing only really works if you're within one kind of um, broadcasting region. Uh, Doctor Who has form on this, uh, not only that the very first episode of BBC Wales Doctor Who rose, leaked, um, and fans had all seen that ahead of, or many fans had seen that ahead of transmission, but also uh, back in uh, 2011, uh, there was something that I keep wanting to call Rivergate, in the hope that this will take off, uh, where the character River Song uh, you know, there was a mystery about who this character uh, was um, within, and it was a big kind of twist and a big cliffhanger moment. Um, and the producers um, you know, went through a whole series of processes to make sure this didn't get out, only for a group of fans who called themselves the Silver Cloak who adopted this identity from Doctor Who's Diagesis. It's a group of old age pensioners in an episode who tracked the Doctor and phoned round each other to say, Oh, I've seen him. Um, and this isn't um, old age pensioners or older people who are these fans, they tend to be students. The students have time, uh, and they have temporal capital quite often, even if they don't have economic capital, and they have the time to kind of be um, up all night 
in many cases, watching night shoots or being able to follow filming. Um, so particularly Cardiff-based students who often have been members of this, this fan group called The Silver Plate. Uh, and they managed to find out who River Song was by following filming, and they pull information and spot where the unit bases are and where the signs are for where um, lorries are driving to form a base and where they're filming. So all sorts of information is pulled and shared on a real-time basis online um, through um, hashtags and on forums, so we use Twitter to share this information. Uh, hashtag BWSR is the hashtag for Dr. Who set reports. And so fans share this information in real time and they'll, if they can get to filming, they'll, they'll congregate and watch filming. And a group of fans discovered there was a scene being filmed in Penarth, a very nice area outside Cardiff, in somebody's back garden. And it was a scene where River Song talks about her identity, who she what really was. And the fans managed to stand at the bottom of the garden uh, in, in the public domain, on the, on the pavement, on the road, just on the other side of a big hedge. And the production team didn't realise they were there. So they overheard the whole scene and got video footage through the hedge. Um, and Doctor Who's producers were hugely annoyed. Uh, now, this might seem kind of comical, but actually uh, that video was taken down uh, fairly shortly after it had been posted. If you look for an online trace of some of this stuff now, you won't necessarily find kind of huge amounts of information about the fact that fans did know this. They found it out the last day of filming, so about six months ahead of um, broadcast. It didn't get into the mass media or into the tabloids or mainstream media. Um, the BBC managed to kind of keep it out. <coughs> and it's already, this, this fact that this happened, that fans achieved this, has already been lost from both academic and fan cultural histories of Doctor Who. So James Chapman, whose work is uh, in all other respects excellent, uh, has done a cultural history of Doctor Who, and he, he updated that in 2013 to do a chapter on Stephen Moffat era and most recent Doctor Who. It didn't refer to the fact that there had been a security breach. So if you're not following social media on an ongoing basis, because I will tend to do this, if you're not actually aware of what these fans are doing, but you're going on a mass media record, you're going on kind of news coverage or accepted kind of forms of knowledge, you will miss that this, these sorts of things are actually happening. So there's a key challenge for research in contemporary culture in terms of how close are you to the object of study and are you ethnographically studying some of these responses almost in real time, which is a huge investment, which is why I'm writing only about Dr. Who a lot of these days, because I have to keep up with all this fun to write about it. Uh, equally, Stephen James Walker, a fan historian, uh, who may not have wanted to upset the BBC, uh, but I would have expected a fan historian to be aware of, of this having happened, this security kind of breach. Again, he didn't write about it in you know, his, kind of, um, his book on um, that particular year of Doctor Who. So, what in um, fan cultures I call just in time fandom, um, you can suggest that just in time fandom involves the rhythms and timeliness of fan responses. So I originally used the, the notion of just-in-time fandom to talk about the idea that as soon as an episode had ended, fans would want to be online kind of posting reviews and comments. Um, so that the concept was originally a kind of post-textual uh, notion rather than a pre-textual social media context um, idea, really. Um, but we can kind of broaden that out because now, in relation to the use of social media, fan cultures as interpretive communities aren't just interested in you know, not quite being the first to kind of post what they think of an episode, but getting in, you know, pretty early on, so what, what they think, that would be a mark out of ten. They're also interested in responding immediately to whatever events have unfolded in relation to their fan object. So if a rumour starts to circulate, fans will want to kind of get online and find out about it. If filming has happened, then there could be photos taken by other fans or paparazzi. <coughs> um, Fans will want to get online and see those and kind of keep up to date. If information leaks, and we can talk a bit about some massive uh, leaks in Doctor Who world that people might be aware of a bit later, or incidents in the kind of um, fan culture if some fans have done something controversial. So these online interpretive communities might be partly focused on gaining spoiler knowledge in line with Hasty's epistemological economy. But there's also a sense of almost kind of just in time found it was about keeping up with one's fan object and, and one's fan culture. Um, so there's a, there is a, a powerfully a powerful timeliness or temporality uh, to this. And Jenkins updating his work 
um, in 2006, uh, revisiting the kind of classic textual poetry's work, its work on convergence culture, uh, uses Pierre Levy's idea of collective intelligence rather than uh, perhaps interpreting I think you could argue that these patterns here in relation to wanting, uh, in relation to time, temporality, wanting to share this stuff immediately, with immediacy and almost liveness, that that's part of the kind of temporal rhythms of um, an overarching fan interpretive community. But what might, in, in relation to contemporary culture, what might social media kind of do here? Um, I want to argue that they kind of spurred this move from just in time fandom to pretty much 24 7 uh, always on digital fandom or all the time fandom rather than just in time fandom. So if you are uh, very much a devoted fan of something, it may be difficult to switch off from that. Um, it does depend on the rhythms of the fan object. If there's a long hiatus, show up fans kind of now joke about the fact that they're a fan that has this massive hiatus where nothing much is happening until filming starts again. So what do they do to fill in that time? And have an awareness of that really as a fan culture. Um, but if you've got reasonably kind of regular uh, new material forthcoming, um, it becomes possible to kind of, within those kind of industrial rhythms, pretty much always be checking in on what new news is. And also as fans, um, what Jenkins Ford and Green refer to as spreadable media, also being able to um, share mashups or um, responses to, sometimes comedic responses to bits of information and so on, or parodies of kind of new um, textual material or fan-made trailers has become a uh, kind of boom area in relation to what we've to. Um, equally, Alice Marwick has argued that Twitter doesn't do away with the notion of certain communities of interpretation or what she calls network, the networked audience. Um, the fact that, that Twitter, through hashtags, can be searchable or through retweets can kind of reach um, an unpredictable uh, range of readers uh, it doesn't do away with the idea that if you're following somebody on Twitter, it's likely that you've got some investment if you're following a celebrity or a TV showrunner or, or somebody in a Sherlock production team or Doctor Who production team, you're probably still bringing a certain interpretive framework um, to a, a role as part of what Smarwick calls a networked audience. And Chuck Tryon suggests that that kind of generates in relation to Twitter and the idea of getting this real-time information, both from other fans and from showrunners and production teams, and generates a kind of culture of anticipation, which very much resonates with this kind of all-the-time fan or pre-textual <coughs> culture, trying to get this information ahead of um, the, the text actually existing and then being broadcast during its kind of production process, effectively, or even pre-production and post-production. So you can argue that media texts, we you know, really need to, in terms of researching this contemporary media culture, um, not entirely decenter texts, they're still there and they're still important, but paratexts and all the, the proliferation of material around texts, including audience-created paratexts, I think become more important. And they're structured, you can argue, uh, in relation to unfolding events. There, there's a certain kind of, a trade will be released and then there'll be a response to that, which you can argue might be structured by uh, different interpretive communities. Uh, the valorised value liveness of Twitter, which I think has been part of it, it's brand, if you like, you could argue. Uh, and also fans' desires to interact both with each other in real time, but also with showrunners, have all kind of fed into that, really. Um, and you can track some of this, these developments back to circa 2009. Uh, so a little mention of Twilight. Um, I've read some things on Twilight. Twilight's quite intriguing, you know, some of these things. Um, although Doctor Who wants to be a focus really. Um, but David Brisby, and this is an unusual person theorising this. This was the production designer of Twilight on Twilight New Moon, who wrote a piece uh, in Perspective, which is a journal for kind of designers, set designers. Uh, and Henry Jenkins has referenced this, and has been taken up in, in fan studies. Uh, but he was a professional who was theorising his experience working on Twilight New Moon, uh, where when they were kind of set dressing at a house at an, an exterior external location, Twilight fans would discover where this house was, and they would drive, they do like a fan drive-by, where they drive past and then hang out the car taking photos which would be immediately uploaded and then would be shared internationally uh, by the fandom. And so the production team um, became very kind of aggravated by this because they felt they were under surveillance. Uh, and so Brisbane talks about the kind of 
how relaxed they all were when they were behind closed doors in the studio rather than being in a public, in public space. And to try and avoid fans finding out spoilers and information about design, they started building kind of like 12 foot high walls around where they were filming to kind of try and stop fans from kind of getting um, a line of sight or kind of visual access. Uh, so the rise of the instant, what, what Brisbane calls instant fan-made media, that fans can take photos, they can tweet information, and it's immediately uh, potentially shareable within that fan culture, um, trans culturally and transnationally, um, you know, within limits of you know, if it's written language, um, whether people can kind of read that and you know, engage with that. But it's very easily kind of shareable uh, and poses a threat to what historically uh, and what is still held to be the case is media producers desire to lock down information, control information, because they want to control publicity. They don't want kind of fuzzy, fan taking photos of, of a monster or, or some piece of design looking a bit chunky. They want their lovely, shiny promotional trailer to be how uh, mass audience kind of first experience <coughs> these things. So, Doctor Who fandom equally kind of track back to 2005. There were many debates around what was the kind of set etiquette for taking photos on set, i.e., in public space when the filming was happening. Um, but by 2009, that, those debates really disappeared, and it was kind of, kind of accepted that fans would be types of set reporters or would get this information and would share it online. So, producers, media producers have become much more used to the to and fro of this kind of informational war. However, there's been a kind of, a kind of major development in relation to Doctor Who recently, uh, in that the, the entire first five scripts uh, of the next series of Doctor Who which starts on August the 23rd. It is possible to Google and find and download the entirety, and these are the official scripts exactly as, as they are, uh, the entirety of the first five episodes in script form, and as far as I know, at least, or certainly, the opening episode of Deep Breath, it's called, which will premiere on, I say, on August the 23rd. You can, you can watch an early work print of that. It's, it's downloadable. So, major Doctor Who fan forum, and, which was the... Uh, Followed on from it had a predecessor forum out post Gallifrey, which predated Doctor Who's return in 2005. Gallifrey Base was founded in 2009, so just some figures, um, so I'm not expecting people will know this, but it's about 77,000 members. This is a fairly major forum, and, and I took these figures this morning uh, more than 8 million messages. Um, if you're studying fandom, you don't have to have read all of those, luckily. <laughs> Um, but in line with the notion of unfolding events, if you're looking at fan responses to the trailer that's just been released, or you know, the trailer that was on at half time uh, in, the, in the World Cup final on the BBC, then you've got certain threads that you, you're following. So it is it's within that, you know, there might be thousands of members, but it's usually sort of 500 active posters, and there are specific threads that it's actually possible to follow in real time um, what is being said in terms of a kind of netnography or cyber ethnography. So Gallifrey Base had to create a kind of an official policy response to this massive leak. And they did something very kind of curious and interesting. And that they basically suggested, despite having a spoiler section, they suggested that it was unfair to the BBC and disrespectful of fans to openly discuss, you know, fact, you know the fans all knew this stuff was out there, but it would be disrespectful to discuss the leak scripts. And it would be potentially damaging the show. And, and as good fans, they ought to respect the program and respect the wishes of the BBC. So, and they used, the analogy that was used was the notion of is this cricket or not? So it was deemed, this was in a very lengthy statement from the forum owners and, and um, moderators, it was deemed that it, would, it was not cricket to talk about the leaked information. So, so now it's there, you can read it, but it, it's not playing the game, it's not fair, it's not fair to the BBC. Uh, however, fans could carry on discussing spoilers for episode six onwards. That was still, because they do this, they, they, you know, they share photos and, and, and debate spoilers and try and get leaks and bits of information. So they could carry on with that game, but slightly bizarrely or counterintuitively, despite the fact that this huge amount of information was out there, it was deemed that that was not to be discussed. So, and it was in fact recommended that, that if you were a good fan, you wouldn't read those scripts. So I, I hate to tell you, but I'm a very bad fan, because <laughs> I had to read them for research purposes. Uh, so you can argue that the epistemological economy, the ways of knowing, 
is temporarily supplanted here in terms of the response to a specific um, provocation and event. Um, it's temporarily supplanted instead by a different kind of economy, what Henry Jenkins has called fandom's moral economy, where fans debate and discuss what it means to be a fan, what is appropriate, good, authentic fan behaviour. Um, to be a drooler, to drool over a celebrity, or to sexualise them in many fan cultures would be inappropriate behaviour. Um, one should rise above that. Uh, or to critique certain aspects of the fan object might be seen to be inappropriate. So Jenkins has argued that almost all fan cultures won't just work as interpretive communities, they'll have forms of morality that won't be entirely uncontested, however. So you can find, I've got lots of kind of quotes, but many people, really, I was going to quote from Gallifrey Base properly, I would have to get permission um, from every post that I've signed. <coughs> quote or suppose, but effectively there was, the language of morality was directly used. People were saying, I can't believe this has become a moral issue. And other people were saying, no, you know, you've got to kind of be respectful, um, you know, and, and we're accepting both the forum kind of owner's uh, policy, but also the BBC's discursive kind of structuring of uh, this uh, incident. So these massive major spoilers have led to fans as an interpretive community in relation to this one forum, so it's a site specific, positioning um, themselves in relation to both discourses of piracy uh, and uh, morality. So here's what the BBC had to say. So producers and brand managers effectively attempt to discipline fan activities. This is a power struggle, cultural power struggle between fans and producers. And, and I would say in this instance, Bizarrely, the producers have lost on an epic scale in that there's been this huge security breach, but they've managed to kind of snatch victory from the jaws of this vast defeat because their statements, the discourses that um, brand managers, <coughs> as a brand manager, the discourses that brand managers have put into play have been significantly picked up and reproduced within the space of at least this major forum. Um, these discourses won't play out in the same way across YouTube. Uh, or on Twitter or in other kind of areas. So one of the things we would need to think about as we're searching contemporary culture and its interpretive communities is to what extent are those site-specific or platform-specific. That, that is a highly significant issue. You might be able to talk at an abstract level about an overall fan interpretive community, but there's clearly a distinct uh, interpretive community in terms of response on Gallifrey base compared to outside of um, that forum. So BBC, BBC Worldwide said, we would like to make a plea when they know they can't control information, and you get the language of, of, of pleading, special pleas. Uh, we'd like to we'd make a plea to anyone who might have any of this material and spoilers associated with it, not to share it with a wider audience. So it's kind of deemed to be okay to just read it and not tell anyone. But you know, don't kind of tweet it and put it out there or put it on Facebook for people to just act against and can't come across. Um, so don't share it. So that everyone can enjoy the show as it should be seen when it launches. And here's the kind of um, almost kind of moral background of a very interesting kind of discourse. We know only too well that Top Two fans are the best in the world. We thank them for their help with this and their continued loyalty. So you know, it's, it, it, you know be the best fans in the world. Be, be a true fan. Be loyal. Um, and this is the discourse that is put into play. And then the uh, people running Gallifrey Base don't reproduce quite that discourse, but there is a sense of we should respect the BBC and we should behave ourselves because we don't want to do damage Doctor Who or bring the show somehow into disrepute. However, it's not only that, there is also, we might expect this, with allegations of piracy. Um, now, this wasn't outright piracy, it was a security breach. So, somebody working for BBC America, I don't know if people follow this. Uh, Marcelo Camargo, whose name is now a legend, Dr. He found it, because his name is watermarked across all the scripts and he's on um, every moment of the work print. So people are saying they want to set up, they, you know, if I have a band, I'll call it Marcelo Camargo, and people are saying they're found him now. This is a legendary name. So um, Marcelo Camargo, working for BBC America in a new office in Miami, was given uh, the scripts and the work print, so presumably it could be translated for, a globe, for the global launch. Unfortunately, this material was up on a server that you could Google. It was, the server wasn't meant to be publicly accessible, but it was. And somebody found it. It's unclear whether there was a tip off or what. It's slightly murky, that. No, no one's quite what's wrong with that. But the official narrative, as, as it exists in the fan culture, is 
and it's as it exists with the BBC and then publicly, is it was a security breach, somebody spotted it, and then they downloaded it and then it got out. So Stephen Moffat speaking at the London Film and Comic Con at the weekend, this was his take on it. What would you do if you saw someone's window was open, i.e. saw a server was, on, was public, it wasn't meant to be, as they were going away? You tell them, you tell those people, you wouldn't go in and help yourself to their stuff. So at, what fans should have done when they saw this server was public, and, and all my word is that there's an MP4 of a Doctor episode that isn't on until August and there's a script of it, is they should have notified the BBC and said, BBC, look, somebody's made a bit of a boo-boo here, but what they shouldn't have done was download it and put it up on torrenting websites, but that, that's what happened. So Stephen Moffat is quite prepared to, if not outright say, but imply, uh, she did say outright, any fan viewing the material is receiving stolen goods. So there is that discourse of piracy uh, in terms of pretextual poaching that fans are also um, potentially wanting to ward off um, or engage with. I didn't have time. I did this slide. Um, so interpretive community uh, becomes a matter of, in this case, of defining certain material that is just not cricket. Huge spoilers, you'd think fans would be interested in spoilers within their interpretive community, but instead it's defined as not playing the game for Gallifrey Base, and therefore fans should either not read the material, and this is reading the recommendation, or should read it and not tell anyone what's in it. Um, so I want to suggest this relates to some of Cornell Sandboss's work from the book Fans from 2005, where Sandboss argues rather than tax being polysemic, he has this old phrase, neutrosemic, seems to imply that texts can almost mean whatever you want them to, but he does back off uh, from that, because that's a slightly absurdist kind of position. But what he means by this is that there's so much in relation to big franchises or serial TV, there's so much material that accumulates around the text now, in terms of power textual material and promos, and you know, it's fan fiction part of the text. It might be kind of fanon, fan accepted canon, but not official um, canonical material. Um, so, you know, where, where, where do you draw the line around paratexts or spin offs or transmedia storytelling uh, or, fan, or user generated content? Uh, so, Samuel suggests that what fans do is almost draw a line around what they include in the text. And so, texts become neutrosemic because as audiences are almost having to draw, not entirely individual, but I would argue interpretive communities draw certain lines around texts and what they include and what they exclude. And usually, certainly for Doctor Who's uh, fan interpretive community, that line is drawn very generously. So fans want to kind of keep up with fan knowledge, they want to keep up with very wide range of commercially available audio adventures, or novels that were published historically, or novels that will be published now, um, or all sorts of paratexts. They want to see the new trailer as soon as it's out, They'll be very annoyed if there's a trade that's on San Diego Comic Con and it doesn't leak, or there isn't a shaky video of it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, British Doctor Who fans were hugely frustrated for the last series there was a San Diego Comic Con trailer. So the Americans, it was a national, nationalist, um, curiously, um, dispute. The, the BBC was British, and British fans were, ta were not taxpayers, were licensed to be players, and they should have got it first. But the Americans got it, and this was bad and wrong, and what they understand. And it's quite an interesting debate to have about how that ought to work industrially. So usually fans will be very completed in relation to industry power attacks. But you might argue that are leaked scripts or is a work print? Can you think of those as being power textual? They're not trades, they're not designed as secondary material. I mean, we might need to actually have a debate not only where one draws the line around textual matter as an interpretive community. But are these just simply pseudo texts? Are they you know, versions of the text that are unfinished rather than paratextual? But for some fans who are, who are um, spoiler files, they, you know, it's not going to alter their enjoyment at all and they're happily watch these things. It's not saying the seeing the finished text in colour on the, on the big screen TV um, or at the cinema or wherever, so they're not worried. But there's this debate over um, where the line is around what will be read or should be read by this fan interpretive community. So the fan interpretive community at Gallifrey Base is both temporarily responsive but also very much multi-dimensional because there can be all sorts of different fan factions and factions within this fan forum. Some fans that are interested 
in uh, being Galatian shippers or shippers. It's fewer guys because this is an older, more male fan forum, but there are still some shippers um, who might be more defensive in that cultural space. Um, there will be fans of different ages and generations who champion different moments of Doctor Who. So if you like a certain era or a certain Doctor, you would be aware that your tastes are out of line with the kind of dominant view. So if you like David Tennant and Matt Smith, that's a good popular view. If you, if you like Sylvester McCoy, just Doctor Who in the 1980s, or Colin Baker, Doctor Who in the 1980s, then there's something wrong with you. <laughs> and so those kind of fans will actually post, going, oh, I know, I know you're going to attack me, but I, I, I saw those episodes when I was five, and that's why I love them. So there's a kind of what I call an anti-fandom. There's the idea of before they, joined, they were part of the interpretive community when they were children, they just loved the show, and that's emotionally how they became fans. But then they become socialised into an interpretive community that has golden ages and, and eras of Doctor Who that were rubbish, um, and that's part of the pattern of knowledge, the epistemological economy. So these fans become defensive and apologetic within what should be their own fandom. So there's all these kind of different kind of um, lines of difference and tension, if you like. But the response to this massive event, this inciting incident of the leak, kind of overrides that stuff and overrides it. So suddenly the key thing becomes, what is your position in relation to the piracy discourses, or what is your position in relation to the, this fan forums um, on the hoof ad hoc um, policy? And what, and what has tended to happen is, and fans did start to post this until it became apparent that they could be banned for posting it on the forum, fans did start to post saying, well, I know we're not allowed to talk about it, and we're not allowed to say where you can find it, but just to let everyone know on the forum, you can easily find this stuff if you go to these kinds of places. And, and type in these kinds of things. And then even that was forbidden, um, because you're effectively still hinting too strongly at where people can find material that the forum owners um, don't wish to support. Um, so what's tended to happen, I would say, is that there's been a counterintuitive positioning where the, both the policy and the kind of discourse of being respectful of the BBC's wishes has resulted in a fan interpretive community that usually pursues spoilers, or a major subset of it pursues spoilers. Instead, they seem to become um, completely kind of um, forbidden and have become like a, a, a structuring absence on the forum. So, if you go on spoiler threads, they're literally now discussing episode six because the fans are so concerned about or being seen to do morally the wrong thing or being banned that they've just backed off from it completely. But of course what you can do is you can, you can self-reflexively, and being aware of this, you can move out of that interpretive community. You can go off to YouTube or a torrent site, find the material, if you wish to do so, view it anyway, but as long as you don't then go back and try and discuss it, you can move out of that interpretive community and its norms, its temporary, its reactive uh, norms. You can move out of that, um, engaging more piracy or shift discourses and then move back grudgingly into the forum space where people have social connections and bonds and they don't kind of step away through until transmission of episode six. Um, so fans' traditional popular knowledge is here. Um, I always like to kind of draw on John Fisk. Um, what could be kind of resistive or contestatory popular knowledge is I, I would argue, in terms of this info war, are confronting m more significant, more powerful production discourses of authentic or good fandom. Attempts to kind of morally discipline, discursively discipline uh, these fan cultures. Hence, as I say, what should have been a kind of a considerable um, defeat, really, in terms of information war for producers, they do seem to have managed to kind of clutch uh, grasp back from that some measure um, of success in that equally all of these spoilers and all of this material you can go and find it online um, but it hasn't yet the key acid test it does, does it get into the mass media um, and this you know, this moral economy seems to be holding um, at least for now um, so gone considerably over time did start that five minutes late so I've done a bit over time so I shall finish there thanks very much thank you Does anyone uh, have any questions in the last Oh no, there was my, the last, that was my last slide. <laughs> <laughs> little summary, little summary to the back of half one. Go on, yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you talked a lot about uh, <coughs> as a, an interpretive mm -hmm. uh, that struck me that it's, uh, it 
it seems like it's something quite different than the style of positions I give to the communities. Because they're actively engaging in the process of semiosis, trying to anticipate meaning, essentially. Uh, and I, I thought that maybe this is kind of central to the, the, the problem of the lead script, is that the lead script uh, sh shuts down meaning, whereas they're, they're, uh, they're kind of uh, sneaking around in heads and taking photographs. It's sleuthing and it's, it's a way of, of establishing meaning. It's, 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 it's semiosis trying to figure out beforehand what is the content of these episodes. But the scripts or the lead uh, work would obviously uh, not be part of that, that yeah. uh, interpretive activity, so to speak. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting um, way of framing it and thinking about it. I guess my kind of take on that would be that I, I couldn't quite see or I wouldn't agree that there's binary there, in the sense that um, the the spoiler files, the, the fan, the spoiler hands, the people who hang around by the hedges or are up all night kind of for a night shoot to kind of see what happens. And we'll be taking photos and we'll be sharing those and so on. Uh, or we'll be searching kind of online um, agents' information to see if somebody has got on their CV they think can't, or a director's been appointed that hasn't been announced in a press release. So they'll be doing all sorts of uh, things in terms of trying to get information in relation to the skirmishes of, of info war. But what tends to happen is because these are almost always long term fans, <coughs> they are already within an interpretive community that would work quite strongly in line with Stanley Fisher's kind of notion of interpretive community. That is to say, when they get the new bit, they want they want the new bit of information, but they'll tend to kind of pull it into um, patterns of reading and ways of reading that are that are sedimented um, and that can almost be predicted in terms of their knowledge of the history of Doctor Who and, and of the history of the production. So there is a sense in which the, the semiosis, the kind of sleuthing, it is, it is sleuthing, um, I would say it doesn't work against the kind of um, fishy and interpretive community, but potentially is kind of recuperating within it, in fact. Yeah, I, I guess I did mean it uh, in a kind of binary sense mm. that way. But I mean... Well, I wouldn't see those alternatives. I mean, from I the sleuthing point of view, I would. Uh, mm they would actually want to, to create that script themselves and then see the episode and be happy that they're right that. They, they, they want to, yeah, no, they want, they want to, there are, no, clearly are fans who want to create um, scripts themselves in a range of no, ways. No, 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 not scripts, but the script of the episode is kind of a... An imagined version of the Yeah, but, uh, or easy and, and the approach to, to their script being basically create the, the actual episode themselves before they actually mm -hmm. see it. I'm not sure that's necessarily what many of the fans are doing. Um, the semiosis, it seems to be targeted much more as, there are forms of speculation, but it's much more targeted at what can they sift. Um, Jason Mattel has, has called this kind of thing forensic fandom, where the idea is you're hunting through clues, but you're trying to construct through that something which as much as can be, or your hope or desire is, what you construct from the clues will be accurate. So there are some fans who will post spoilers on Gallagher base, who will, over time, will build up a reputation that will be proven to be correct. And they will have a higher fan cultural capital, they'll have a higher status, because their information is, it's still not always going to be true, but it's assumed by fans to be more likely to be the case. And so what they want are kind of kernels of, um, accurate kind of pretextual material that they can then loop around and speculate around, but still normally within <coughs> an overarching inter interpretive architectural framework. So I'm, I'm, it may be that we're just thinking across each other, but I'm, I'm not. Like, in terms of this fan culture, what you're suggesting um, doesn't quite seem to kind of map onto it. I'm just yeah. <laughs> I'm just wondering if the relationship between fans and producers it necessarily needs to be as antagonistic as the way you've stated it. I think mm -hmm. with other shows, maybe not so. Like, so with Game of Thrones, that's one that immediately came up, where you know you have an existing text, which is the book, and there are some people that have read those, and then there's always some people that haven't read the book but are watching a TV show. So in some ways, half of the 
the half the fan does is have, oh well I've read the book so I'm not gonna I'm gonna like keep these spoilers from the rest of you. Um, so there's like bigger <coughs> circles of this interpretive community. But I just wonder if there's also more respect for the material in a certain sense, respect in quotes because of the existing text. Um, and then also there's people respect the fact that there's gonna be a gap between existing text and how the showrunner is adapted. So so in some ways they're they're like Okay, fine, there's some spoilers if you, were, if you were to read the books and anyone can go read the books, but then on the other hand, you know, let's speculate about what's going to happen to this character and how, that, how different that's going to be from the text. Um, and so in some ways there isn't a sense of trying to undermine or release material before. I think, yeah, no, that's a good question. I think, yeah. I mean, I've suggested here that how we would think about this in terms of an interpretive community, even around one show, would, would need to be potentially platform specific or forum specific, site specific. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I do think that's a kind of key issue, as well as the notion of, of factoring in temporality and kind of re real time responses and kind of shifts and textual events, effectively, rather than just the text. Um, so, everything that kind of precedes and, and comes after that. Um, so, that kind of um, paratextual or textual event model would kind of fit quite well with Game of Thrones. But you're right, given that there are specificities, in some cases, if you're dealing with an adaptation, then there are different levels of spoiler, necessarily. Um, so there are the kind of spoilers you can get if you've read the novels, um, versus spoilers you might get in terms of how the adaptation of, um, works, or how an episode um, works. Um, and whether or not there's, there's no tension, um, didn't George Martin um, give the finger to an interviewer um, recently. Um, do people know this one? Oh, I'm sure I read this recently. Yeah, about a thing about his health. Yeah, yeah. and it was a journalist saying, mm -hmm. what, do, what do you say to fans who are worried that you might pass away before you finish yeah. writing? And he, and he was a bit grumpy, and he basically, you know, this is what I have to say to them. Um, so, um, but he, did, he did that kind of symbolically to the, the journalist, and then got reported, and then fans responded. So, um, you know, there may not be exactly the same kinds of tension, <coughs> but there are likely to still be um, cer certain forms of tension or conflict, I would suggest, which tend to be structural, um, because media producers who are managing major shows, they, they are, there is an industry discourse of the brand. They are, they, these shows do have, tend to have brand managers. Yeah. And part of what those people do, their job, is to make sure things get publicised correctly and correct information is, comes out at the right time. Um, and so that's becoming an industrial discursive norm. And fan activities sometimes will fit into that and resonate with that. But there will still be moments where there could be conflicts or tensions. Um, so Twilight, Twilight, uh, obviously you could have read the Twilight novels, so you know, that would be a similar kind of thing. But what the fans were doing by getting photos of set dressing was kind of saying, oh, okay, they're using that kind of location. Or in the novel, it says that, that is red, but they've done it this color, or they've made this decision. And the fans were as completist as um, fans with very high fan culture capital were effectively tearing apart online pretty much in real time the, dis the dis design decisions of the design team. Yeah. And, to, and to an extent that clearly did distress the, the, the production design was, you know, was peeved and unhappy about its work not being seen properly, you know, within the means on set and lit and edited, but being pu pulled apart and critiqued as, oh, they've changed this, da da da. Um, and so, hence David Brisbane writing about instant fan made media, and he's quite negative about it. Mm -hmm. And he literally says in that piece, we all just had a sigh of relief and really enjoyed working behind closed doors on a closed set because we knew it was secure and we could relax. So even there, it's an adaptation. It's, the, the spoilers take on a different status because they are those details rather than the, the overall plot. But there are still possibilities for tension. But yeah, I wouldn't say that the model one could arrive at or the approach one could arrive at through Doctor Who could necessarily be just rolled out across different yeah. franchises. And lastly, um, can I ask you about, I mean, I can completely empathize with what I can imagine what it must be like to try to, I mean, basically, when we, we are doing research with a moving target, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. Could you share with us, uh, like, what having your techniques to to do that, like when it's moving all the time and it's on social media and stuff? What what have been your strategies for data collection? Uh, okay. Um, to try to, uh, wherever possible, try to archive. Well, if you're studying something for a PhD, or in my case, it's an area I'm writing in quite often. Um, to really try to manage your time so that you can actually give bits of time to it on a fairly regular basis. Um, that if you see that something major has occurred, that's, you know, part, it's going to, if your moving target really has just moved. So then, become, you know, if you can do that on a pragmatic basis, to be able to kind of give some responsive time to that. And to really try to kind of archive material and pull material, you know, as much as you can and as it's there. Um, because if you try to kind of go back to stuff, I mean, I tend to be qualitative, I would have to give that provisor. So I'm not, in the work I do, in fact, all the work that I've done, I haven't been doing data mining or kind of quant work. So if you did quant work, if you, if you can, you know, that may work in different ways. But in terms of kind of qualitative um, real time moving targets, it's trying to kind of archive or, or you know, access. Um, and have records of material almost kind of as it kind of moves. And as I said when I was giving the talk, in relation to looking at um, what is pretty much the major fan forum, which I tend to study because you'll get, you know, this is an interesting arm in of itself, would you study a fan forum where you might get quite detailed, lengthy postings people would have debates? Or should you be looking at that, or should you be looking at tweets, which would be much more fragmentary, <coughs> um, or should you be looking at Facebook postings, which might be um, you know, much more kind of, or, you know, to, or you know, relatively brief. So there's a kind of, the textualist kind of bias within some of this work, I think, tends to lead researchers to want to look at material that would be, in traditional terms, richer material, which potentially means looking at a kind of forum rather than other, looking at other kind of, or live journal or you know, things that follow on from that where you get a certain type of fan debate that's probably going to be a more um, educated fan, it's going to be a more literate fan, it's going to be older fans usually, younger fans will write in quite different ways, uh, fans without that structuring access to forms of cultural capital will tend to, like others will, will tend to write in quite different ways. So there's a there's a broader kind of methodological problem, which I think is an impasse, is kind of insurmountable about where you would look in the first place. But there is then the pragmatics of if you do qualitative work, of how best you can try to keep up with the moving target. But clearly some writers don't keep up with those moving targets, because I can give you those references for studies that are you know, published, academically published material that will literally say security was kept tight around the River Song storyline. And whoever read that manuscript, or that, you know, they simply hadn't kept up with what had actually happened. Um, so yeah, I think it's about really, for in terms of PhD research and ongoing research, you know, really having that focus on it. If you're, if you're interested in getting the, the granular detail of the moving target, I mean, this material will potentially. I've already been asked to do two different book chapters for two different books about um, Peter Capaldi as the new doctor. So one will be kind of official BBC power texts promoting him and how they managed his fandom and, and the fact he'd been a lifelong fan and how they managed the kind of age kind of issue and so on. But then uh, another book chapter which I've just been asked to do will basically, you know, I'm going to do this, the kind of fan response to the leaks. Because these are fans not only getting information, these are Doctor Who fans encountering a new Doctor for the first time, which is a massive event in Doctor Who fandom. They're seeing, seeing, they are seeing, seeing and reading about a new Doctor and how he's portrayed ahead of the actual kind of release um, through scripts and, and so on, through work prints. So in that sense, that's kind of unprecedented. So I'll do another piece looking at the audience creating power texts and responses. Um, Sorry, that's a no, that, that's um, something I'd like to pick up on as well. I guess so those days you kind of ask in the same way to do all that, so it's the same um, a topic that came up yesterday with Roger Luckhurst on archives. It's yeah. like, the same thing, you know, all archives are, are generative, you know, yeah, there's a fantasy, so it's the total archive. 
and the conspiracy thing from the next one. Good work as always kind of self-generated. Yeah. And in contemporary studies, especially we generate our own archives and uh, decide that it's not true, as you mentioned. But I think um, I just wanted to, you kind of, well, you kind of touched on it. I, I, I don't want to paint it as a binary. Um, okay. But you said that you'll do kind of two uh, chapters, so kind of official one and uh, an unofficial one. Yeah. Kind of that way. Well, that's just the kind of way that that was. I didn't decide to do that, as in the sense that I didn't plan that in advance. I got asked to do one mm. and, and agreed to do it, and then got asked to do another chapter on Peter Brown. I thought, well, I don't want to do exactly the same thing as the other one. Yeah. I, I want to know, in terms of a writer, that there's clear water between these two things. Mm. So I'm going to try and polarise them. Right. Oh, sorry. Well, is this the, the, coming back to the title, Info War, uh, as well? And that, yeah. um, I mean, Jeremy had really touched on the issue of politics and cultural studies. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems that this tension, I guess, again, I'm kind of being called into expressing as a binary between official and unofficial. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, uh, how do we kind of navigate that tension? Well, it's clearly a discourse of power. It's, you know, she's a, a, a Taste and values. You put it brilliantly that the you know, moral economy. Uh, it's not just. A, it's not an issue of policing. It seems to be an issue of self-policing. Yeah. But that um, you know that the, the the people who run the forum are kind of fashioning the, the debate in that way. So I just wanted to say something about how you know, how we kind of negotiate those issues. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So that's a really good question. I mean, some of this stuff is certainly open to um, kind of Foucauldian interpretation. And in Triumph of the Time Lord. There's a kind of a Foucauldian thread to, to, to that book, actually, in terms of trying to think about the power relationships between um, production discourse and fan discourse, um, I call it in that book. Um, so it's something that I think, in terms of um, doing fan studies, um, or the version of fan studies that I do, the question of power, and, and my background is in cultural studies, effectively. Um, so I worked with Dave Moore, with Goldsmiths on my MA, my PhD supervisor was Roger Silverstein at Sussex. So my background many years ago, if you like, as a PhD student, was in relation to cultural studies and to cultural studies type questions. So I would hope that that is still you know, present in the kind of work that I do. It might be sometimes more implicit than it ought to be, or I'd like it to, but it's still there, I would, I would want to say. Um, so I think it's, I think, it's really important to keep those questions on the agenda because I think there is some television studies and fan studies work that doesn't do that actually and it's people writing about a TV show because they love it mm. and they can use literary theory to mm. write a, a very finely crafted academic journal article or book chapter but you read it and essentially what that is is a kind of performative Acad an academic performance of the fact that they're just a fan of that show. Mm -hmm. Clearly, I'm a fan of Doctor Who, and some of what I do will work in that way, but uh, you need, there, there's a sense in which I would always want to bring a kind of critical engagement to looking at this stuff. So I'm interested in what discourses does BBC Worldwide try to put into play? Uh, and there are going to be a finite number of discourses that would be culturally reasonable or that could be deployed or appropriated. Likewise, Stephen Moffat, as a showrunner, as a professional, he's clearly unhappy and he's probably sworn a lot of people and probably wanted to fire the infamous Marcelo. Um, but in public, he, he was like, oh, you'll make mistakes. <laughs> and, and I'm upset and miserable. And the person who made the mistake is upset and miserable too. But of course, in six months' time, that person will probably not be working for you. <laughs> um, so but it would be bad PR to kind of go, I want him fired and I'm going to be a vengeful showrunner. Um, which Moffat has done before, and he's granted a pet fact in, in, in public statements. So I think it's really important to look at what the industry is doing, and what those, because those discourses do still, you know, fandom is more mainstream now, and we're aware of some of the languages of fandom, and London Film Comic Con is a massive event, it's hugely over-attended and almost dangerous. Uh, so all these things are kind of happening, but we still need to be really aware of the kind of power differential that still operates between producers and fans. Mm -hmm. um, producers have a very different relationship to the mass media um, compared to fans. Producers can um, speak to, you know, through their brand managers and their PR people, can basically keep stories out of the tabloids. They don't always succeed, but then BBC, BBC Wales have kept Doctor Who's spoilers and stories out uh, of the tabloids. 
and they did employ security staff to who allegedly, as doesn't exist on the record, they allegedly have a blacklist of known fans um, who, if they spot them, they are not welcome at filming, and you will stand right in front of them, um, or you'll put an umbrella up right in front of some people who are just genuinely trying to make their life miserable, to discourage them from, from spreading information. And that clearly also, um, the, the Doctor Who production team monitor social media. So let's say they became aware of the hashtag BWSR production and so forth, and they follow it, and they know who's found what app, um, and, they, and they will respond to that. This is what I mean about info war, but there is monitoring that happens um, that tends to work kind of only in one direction. Um, so producers will try to monitor. So I think, yeah, there isn't an absolute binary between un un official and unofficial, but what tends to happen, sorry, I'm going to finish. But last, last thought on that is, as I said in the talk, what tends to happen is some of the fan discourses do reproduce the production discourses. So, and that's, that becomes like a key kind of issue. What, is take, what moments of resistance might still exist, or not even resistance, it might be moments of um, alterity or just difference, fan difference, but they're not resisting something, they're just do, doing, making their own meaning separately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So where, where are those moments, and how much of the fan discourse is actually, not wholly reproducing, but significantly uh, referring back to um, more powerful media discourse and production discourse? Uh, I was just going to ask a kind of practical question. When you were talking, uh, you said you didn't have quotes from the sort of film. No, this because I wasn't doing it properly, I should have actually, because it's not, it's not technically in the public domain. You have to register and log in, log in. So um, the implication from that would be, since it's not public domain, if I was going to actually quote all sorts of postings, I'd like to get permission. Because okay, I was just going to ask about, in terms of thinking about that kind of fan community and the sort of huge fan community potentially on Twitter where following how I chose air, yeah. in how you make sort of decisions as a researcher. And then if you are, I mean, I know this isn't exclusive to the work you do, but if you are a registered forum participant, then how, how do you present yourself to the people that you're talking to and whose words potentially you make that work for them? Yeah. Um, in terms of the kind of um, Gallifrey base on this forum, I'm trying to think that I actually have directly quoted much material in published work. I don't know if I necessarily have done that. I mean, what, I tend, what my interest in it tends to be you can get a sense of what within a certain subset of fandom, what fans are, how fans are reacting. And so that gives you a kind of, not like a baseline, it gives you a starting point, and then you can kind of look at other published material, so you can, um, that might be public domain material, so you could look at Doctor Who magazine, or you could look at fan, fan sites that would be public domain, and you can see kind of where there are convergences or divergences. I mean, you could just simply do a study, or, or if you go on Twitter and you follow a hashtag, you can, you can kind of start to form the view, oh, right, okay, this is quite a different subset of the fandom who are responding, and usually there will be, it's not just like we tell us, different demographics, or there will be different gender readings, or there will be, diff there will be different age-based readings, or generational readings. Um, ethnicity and, and uh, national identity can correlate with kind of certain differences as well. So even though fandom wants to celebrate itself as just this one community, it never, it never was one community, and it never will be in reality. Um, it's always stratified, um, and there are power relationships and hierarchies that occur. Where usually younger female fans in this fandom, which has been historically um, male dominated, are, are relatively disempowered usually, or tolerated by elder statesmen fans who are actually called cool elder statesmen. They, do they all use their own, they, so, so for you to be able to identify a kind of younger female fan to a, to a kind of typical older male fan, mm. are, you, are you identifying them by profiles? I know they're presumably having sort of authentic profiles on the forum. Yeah, the convention on the forum is that people, don't always actually, but it tends to, the assumption is, is that people are representing um, but you can also um, find those kind of differences by looking across 
the different um, digital sites and spaces. That's more one thing. Yeah. So you can kind of look at um, different culture and um, online cultural spaces that are gendered in different ways. Um, so um, almost historically now, but there's been a kind of people have published on this actually, not me. But there's been a kind of gendered difference between certain gallery based and its predecessor, Atlas Gallery, and um, Doctor Who and Torchwood fans on Live Journal, and there were really quite strong patterns of difference that did appear to correlate with the overall kind of gendering of those you know, communities. Is it time for a drink? Oh, it's time for another question. One, one more question, question. Yeah. Yeah. Matt, and then drink. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to sort of talk a bit about this idea of the spoiler, because there's been various research that sort of said that people who sort of anything in, in, within the field that have proved that people sort of seem to enjoy things more if they know a certain amount about them. First, is the, is the BBC right to police things so closely? I mean, it's a family actually getting far off from Doctor Who by following the spoiler season and then seeing it. So, what point does a spoiler actually become something that spoils? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I would say that. Um, that's why I kind of gestured to this. I didn't want to give it as a half hour talk, but I can't remember that anyway. I didn't want to kind of get too bogged down in, in that you know, the definitional kind of <coughs> issues around it. Um, but you're absolutely right. And clearly, for for a subset of fans who are the spoiler hands or the spoiler files, um, and some people would use the term kind of spoiler holics, and um, this clearly is something that does not damage their enjoyment of, of the adventure text. If anything, it enhances it through speculation, uh, through imagining what might happen, through projecting at least versions of um, different scenarios. Um, so, but by the same token, there are um, spoiler phones. So there are. So this that kind of structuring difference tends to exist. So on this on forum, there is a dedicated specific section only which permits spoilers. Um, and then even within that kind of section, there is then a thread um, for spoilers and speculation. So the idea is if you really want to find the full-on spoiler, you've got to go into a particular section and then go to a particular thread. So the idea is you, you shouldn't stumble over by mistake. That's what tends to upset people. If they've got they define spoiler in a certain way and they're on Twitter or on Facebook, and it's like, oh, you swines. I know there's you know, this stuff kind of, this is a torrent of stuff, information. Oh no, um, and that can happen to, to all of us. So there's definitely a kind of sense of people being pragmatic, and therefore it would, be, it would be very interesting to do um, something maybe like kind of semi-structured interviewing with people to really try to get that sense of kind of thick kind of data about you know their attitudes to spoilers and what do they spoil or, or what do they not spoil. Um, but, but the term spoiler does seem a bit clunky. Um, you probably, in an ideal world, you'd want to be slightly more nuanced or different. It wasn't just like this is going to spoil things. Um, but again, the Ficoli in me wants to kind of say, you know, the spoiler is about certain, it is about certain discourse. And it, and it is potentially a kind of normative still cultural discourse. Um, and it is absolutely a normative discourse that is linked to um, the cultural powers of brand management, where the, the brand manager's professional identity absolutely is bound up with and therefore the brand value and the commerce of it is bound up with this stuff must not get out. And people who work on Doctor Who sign, sign non-disclosure agreements that are legally binding that you can be sued for millions of pounds if it's traced back to you and the information has got out. Um, and um, sometimes people who worked on Doctor Who will tweet a photo and it might, it won't actually be a big spoiler, it might just give some little detail away and clearly that will be monitored and then that will be removed quite quickly. So the term spoiler is a misnomer and there are many more nuanced things going on. But again, it brings, <coughs> to finish, brings us back to the question of power. Because the term spoiler isn't just there because something is wrong, it's there because it's part of cultural power and it's part of the kind of discourses of power of what it means to shape brand value, the brand in franchises in terms of culture. I think it's an artist's and artist's position as well, it's just it's more for the years, but it's a point on which I guess it all falls down, even in sort of imaginative terms, certainly not in real terms. 
what he's invested in, in the reveal and the twist in certain ways, I would say, that the way that he writes and the way that his narratives tend to be structured is around uh, the idea of a certain reveal, of putting something that's kind of seemingly visible or on the surface, but then it's then actually it's about misdirection for the audience and actually they, they see it but they don't see it and there's a kind of twist. So I think his style of writing that works in a certain way. Um, but I, I mean, there's, not, there's, there's an art discourse that operates in certain ways. I mean, he's spoken in interviews about that he won't tell people at all what the script is, what storyline is for a script. And, and, and his argument is he wants to judge when people read the script, how they respond to it, like, did he hide the information well enough? Or if he tells Matt Smith or Peter Parry the story, um, he's kept it in his head and it's a secret. And when he tells them, do they react in the way that he wants an audience to react? So he has a notion of um, a very developed sense of, you know, links to a writer being able to appreciate <coughs> audience uh, response. He has a notion of really withholding information to the extent that you'd expect executive producers to know what script is going to involve, but he won't have shown them the script until the very last minute. He won't have told actors your character is going to be this until the very last possible moment. So. Mm. There's, there's a sense of, kind of withholding investment and the withholding of information there as well, which would mean it would be particularly miserable when they were supporting us. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, I mean, thank you, Matt, for 